Hey folks, my name's David Howes and welcome along to this uh, Manafly webinar. Uh, we've, uh, we've been trialling the uh, Manafly Property Digest over the last uh, few weeks and uh, one of our partners, uh, Ben Everingham at Pumped On Property has been supplying us with some really, really good content. And if you're one of those people that has been digesting that content on a weekly basis and he's had you know, hundreds of uh, video views from the Manafly um, members over the last few weeks, uh, then, then hopefully you've come along tonight to find out more about what Ben does and hear from Ben directly around his story and his experience in the market and some of the things he's seeing. And we're, in a, we're, interested, we're an interesting place in the market with with all the stuff we've been through with with uh, the banking inquiry um, and, and some of the grief that's come out of that around tighter lending rules and, and some of the changes in the market that are seeing changes in, in markets that were booming you know, a year and a half, two years ago that have flattened out a little now uh, or come, come, come off the boil uh, and, and markets that are still growing well. So tonight's Tonight's about being able to spend some time to understand uh, fundamentally some of the things that are happening around the country, but also more importantly, to hear Ben's story. Uh, and he's gonna share with you some of his background and experience, but also um, some examples of some of the things his, his clients are doing as well. And, you know, I've, I've uh, known Ben for, must be five or six years now. Uh, and uh, I've watched him grow his business, grow his client base, grow his reputation um, tremendously in that, in that time. And, and anyone that's been, in the market enough to do, you know, tens of millions of dollars worth of deals, let alone hundreds of millions of dollars worth of deals, just learns things that you just don't learn doing a deal, you know, once in a while. And if you do enough in the property market, you come across all sorts of weird and wonderful scenarios, all sorts of challenges, and, and you learn all sorts, all sorts of lessons. So I thought it was great of Ben to offer to come along tonight and, and spend an hour with you and share some of his knowledge and experience as well. So. Ben, um, just uh, click to the next slide. And folks, if you've just uh, signed in, uh, my name's David Howes. Uh, I'm from Manifly, and um, I'm co-hosting this webinar with Ben Everingham. Uh, he's going to jump on uh, the driver shortly and, and take you through the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes. And, and then we'll do a QA and a session at the end as well. So as Ben goes through uh, and shares his story and, and some of his lessons and advice, if you've got questions, just type them into the, the Q&A bar, type them and send them through and at the end of the webinar, I'll read out all the questions, get Ben to answer those. Uh, and, and so you're welcome to stay for the Q&A session because as often as the case with webinars, you learn you learn lots of good things about the, the questions people ask as well. So hopefully if you've been use, using Manifly for a little while now, you've started to enjoy some of the, the features and changes we've been making recently. Um, tonight's not about Manifly, but you know, I guess our focus with Manifly is to help consumers build wealth faster. Uh, and, and we work with partners like Ben at Pumped On Property who are now starting to complement what we do by providing content and information. Next slide. We've got all sorts of stuff happening in the background. Um, you can just click through that bin um, to, the, to the bottom. We've got all sorts of stuff happening in the background with, with our product roadmap. We've had all sorts of uh, feedback from, uh, from our members with ideas and suggestions, all sorts of stuff we're doing with data over the next uh, next uh, coming weeks and months. So look out for lots of changes, lots of improvements, lots of updates. Uh, we've recently launched our global platform that runs parallel uh, to our Australian platform. And that's gonna allow, this, allow you to start doing some a whole lot more stuff, particularly outside of Australia as well. So um, look out for more information from Gabrielle and Rochelle and our marketing team on that. So tonight is about Pumped On Property. Um, and it's about uh, Ben Everingham, who's joining me tonight from the Sunshine Coast. Uh, I'm here on the Gold Coast uh, in Queensland. And Ben's going to um, tell you about his story, about his experience and share his advice and knowledge. So I don't want to uh, stand on ceremony or, or hold up the procession. Um, so Ben, why don't you take over and uh, welcome along. And, and thanks so much for joining me. And thanks for putting together uh, the presentation, um, especially for tonight, because I know you went to a lot of work. No problems, David. Thank you so much. And just to confirm there, you can hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Beautiful. Um, thanks so much, mate. I really appreciate the opportunity to be um, in partnership with you guys and absolutely love the work that you guys are doing there um, from an investment perspective as well and can't wait to bring my community over there too. Great. Cool. So uh, tonight's conversation, um, as per David's, um, email that you guys received earlier is really talking about a number of things um, that I've learned from the experiences of buying over $350 million worth of property for myself and my clients over the last 10 years. So I'm just going to be really honest with you guys. I think, David, you know my approach. It's pretty 
black and white. Um, as you said, there's some lessons that you learn from um, the experiences of just doing volume over time that you know completely change the way that you think about property, you think about the economy, and you think about investing. So I'm going to talk first about how to replace your current annual salary through property investing. Now, as always, there's more than one way to achieve financial freedom through property. Some people like to buy and flip properties. Some people like to develop them. Some like to buy a couple and pay them off over a lifetime. Some people like to do more speculative stuff. And our job as investors is to take the little snippets of gold that we learn from different people over our journey and then do our best to piece together our own strategy. Now, the strategy that I'm going to talk about today, you may be familiar with. It's called the two properties to financial freedom strategy. Now, Ryan from On Property and I pieced together this strategy while we we're having a surf about a year ago. And the reason for two properties is that less than 20% of investors and less than 3% of Australians ever get past two properties in their lifetime. So we wanted to make it super realistic. And the concept is very simple. You buy two houses, you build two granny flats, you pay off the debt as quickly as you can, and you get a passive income for life. It's no more complicated than that. Now, there are three phases to this two property strategy. The first one is called the foundational stage. And this is effectively where you do 90% of the work. After you've gone through the foundational phase, um, it gets pretty bloody boring, I'm not going to lie, because you're effectively just looking at ways to pay off debt faster. So the step, first step of the foundation phase, which is the first stage, is you purchase your two properties and you build a granny flat on each of those properties. Now, an example of this at the moment in the Brisbane market, which is one that we've been looking at for the last three years since we moved out of the Sydney market, is we want to purchase a high quality house with a big piece of land within 20 k's of Brisbane CBD. So right now you can still do that for $420,000. And because the rent returns in Brisbane are still solid, you can actually rent each of those houses out for between 380 and 400 bucks a week. Then we build a granny flat for around about $120,000 and rent that granny flat out for 300 a week. So effectively we're sitting in a position where um, we're all in for about $540,000 and in the short term, we're getting 680 to 700 bucks a week. But anyone who understands inflation and the laws of compound growth over time, that $700 a week that you're receiving today, within 15 years, just if we get regular inflation or 2 2.5% inflation over the next 15 years, will be more like $1,000 per week per house and granny flat. And if you can get 50 weeks a year of rent times those two properties at a thousand bucks each a week, we're talking about a passive income of around about a hundred thousand dollars per annum for life. Now, obviously there's costs and there's taxes there, but it's a really, really nice start to securing your long-term future and giving you choices in your life, which you may or may not have at the moment. Now, there's some important points there in terms of making this strategy work. And the reason I like it is because after you've added the granny flats on each of the properties, if you're making principal and interest repayments and the properties are sitting at about a 5% interest rate, which seems like it will be, you know, around about that mark for at least the next two to three years, then you put yourself in a position where you're not struggling week to week to actually make the repayments on your property. And I like this strategy because it's extremely, extremely low risk. Now, worst case scenario with this strategy, if you do a 25% principal and interest loan, you will own both of the houses and both of the granny flats outright within 25 years if you're diligent. Best case scenario, you can go to the second stage, which is the acceleration phase. And that's where we speed up this process. So Worst case scenario, this strategy enables you to become free within 25 years, but who wants to wait 25 years to have better choices in our lives? So there's only one question you ask yourself in this second phase, the acceleration phase, and that is, how can I pay off this debt faster? Now, paying off debt can be done in a number of ways. You can work your ass off for the next 15 years and spend all of your free cash flow paying down debt. You can 
use the tax depreciation benefits from the granny flats as chunks each year to pay off debt. You can pay a little bit extra off each week. You can, as the rent increases and the debt decreases on the properties over time, you can use that extra cash flow to pay off more debt. You can go earn more money through your job or change careers or start a little business on the side. You can spend less. There's just an infinite way, number of different ways to pay off debt. The way that I've personally applied this strategy is I've got my two foundational properties and then I went out and bought a number of other properties with the sole intention of adding value to them, writing the property cycle and then selling those properties and making chunks of cash that I could never save in my job and using those chunks of cash to pay off big pieces of debt on these foundational properties. Now, the thing about this strategy, I know it's super simple. Two properties to some of you might sound like a lot. To others, it might be um, you know, not even close to how far you want to take it, and that is completely fine. This is just the concept to show you how simple it is to achieve financial freedom and nothing more than that. Now, if you want to go more than two properties, you can. I've personally bought 11 properties in the last nine years. I've sold most of those now because I don't believe in carrying huge amount of debt and risk. But, you know, you can go as hard or as soft as you want to go. The cool thing after you've bought those two foundational properties and built the two granny flats is you no longer need a job that you don't like anymore or you no longer have to spend the next 15 or 20 years in a job that you hate. And so once you've got your foundation in place and you know that you're going to be financially free in the future, you can make that change in your life for the better, cut down in your job, change locations, work less and do more of the stuff that you really want to do. Or you can just ramp it up, work harder and try and pay off those properties in a shorter period of time. The third and final stage or the third step of this process is to just enjoy what you've done. Now, for a lot of the people that I know, friends, family members or clients that are now financially free, they don't just stop working and sitting, sit on a beach all day but they do have choices in their life and those choices are more around spending more time with the people we care about, training more, traveling more, volunteering more, changing industries without that feeling like I need that money, spending more time with their partners, doing whatever the hell they want to do. And, you know, for some people that might be a year on a beach or a year traveling the world, but most of the time we come back to wanting to achieve things and be productive people in our lives. And so, it is just the foundation to give you more choices and that is all it is. Now, I know a lot of you, like myself, I have three children all under the age of six right now and having a principal place of residence or our own home is extremely important. The simplicity of what I've just explained doesn't really take into account your own home, but you can absolutely, if you already own your own home or that's a priority for you over the next five or 10 years, you can just integrate this strategy around your home. If you already own more than two properties, um, I personally owned nine properties be before I even realized this two property <laughs> strategy. I kind of wish I'd sat down with my 24 year old self when I was just starting to buy in Sydney and understood this because instead of buying 11 properties, I probably could have bought three or four and ended up in equally or a better financial position than I'm in now. So if you already own properties and those properties aren't going to get you financially free within 10 to 15 years, then you can add these types of properties to your strategy. Or, you know, like me, you can sell down some of those properties that aren't going to allow you to be financially free in the time frame that you want and replace them with these types of properties that give you great income, great potential for capital growth and, you know, that financial freedom that you're looking for. There's obviously some assumptions here um, in terms of the rent increasing by 2 to 3% per annum. Um, this strategy also doesn't work unless you take action. You can't sit on your hands. You've got to address your fears. You have to realize that buying property and going through a strategy like this, which is a little bit more active, um, takes you out of that comfort zone that we're all used to. And it doesn't happen without a clear strategy in place. So um, there are some assumptions there, but it is the most basic way that I've been able to find from looking at 10 or 15 different strategies in property and literally talking to 6,000 investors over the last 10 years to actually get from where you are today to where you want to be in the future.
Now, my favorite thing for anybody that's been following the videos there over at Munifly is to talk about timing. And as Charlie Munger says, the big money is not in the buying in the, and the selling, but in the waiting. Now, for those of you who haven't stumbled across Phil Anderson's or Fred Harrison's work, take a note right now and pick up these books as soon as you possibly can. The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking, which is Phil's book, looks at 250 years worth of property booms and busts and share market booms and busts in America. And Fred's books look at The Power and the Land, which is Fred's first book, looks at 300 years of history in the United Kingdom and the booms and busts relating to the stock market as well as property. So the cool thing about Fred is he wrote The Power in the Land in 1983, predicting the 1990 recession. He wrote Boom Bust in 2005, predicting the 2007 to 2010 global financial crisis. And Phil Anderson published The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking in 2007, predicting the 2008 financial crisis. So these guys have looked at history. For those of you who want to time the market more effectively, these are the books to get a really, really decent starting point. Now, Phil has an 18-year real estate clock. I'll, that's all I'll say about that for now. Just I'm conscious of time. Um, but one of Phil's partners, who's a financial planning firm in Melbourne, has sort of overlaid this economic cycle action plan. So effectively, this real estate cycle, according to Phil's and Fred's work, lasts somewhere between 15 and 20 years generally around about 18 years on average over the last 250 years in America. Now, Phil believes that the American market for at least the last 50 to 100 years has driven the Australian market. And the Australian market normally follows the American market loosely by about one to two years. So at the very bottom of the cycle there where you can see point one, this is when we are coming out of a recession or a depression. Think about the global financial crisis. Think about the Great Depression. Think about the recession we had to have. Um, and then if you look at point three, that's more like um, the dot-com boom of 2000 or the environment that we're starting to experience right now. You can see that the stock market is starting to take a hit. You can see the yield curve in America is starting to get very close to inversion. Um, we can see that the conversation in the media in Australia in the last 12 months has been quite negative around property. So, you know, that's that mid-cycle slowdown point. Now, what you've got to be aware of as a property investor is you can use this, you know, 15 to 20 year cycle to time your investments better. And I've done other videos on this over at my channel, Pumped on Property, on YouTube, where I've broken down this 18 year cycle in a lot more detail. But effectively, the two best positions to buy as an investor are either one or three o'clock because they're the two opportunities that you have to actually buy assets at distressed prices before things really kick off. Now, the major difference between three, which is red, which is the mid-cycle slow point, which we're beginning to move into right now, and seven, which is the major crash that leads us into a Great Depression or global financial crisis is at point three, property markets globally don't really experience too much pain. We might see a 5 to 15% decline in the property market. And you can already see that that's beginning to occur in Sydney and Melbourne. Now, it generally only occurs, it's not a nationwide thing, it generally occurs in the marketplaces that have performed the best since the last recession, as opposed to the market as a whole. Um, then when we get to seven, um, sorry, at point three as well, property prices, you know, might go down slightly or they might sit flat for a period of time, which is a huge buying opportunity. Um, the stock market takes an absolute beating there. So for anybody who doesn't understand this stuff, it's now time to really start thinking about your super or stock portfolio because there's every chance that during this mid-cycle point, based on 250 years of American booms and busts that this American stock market and potentially the ASX um, over the next couple of years 
you know, could take a, a pretty big beating anywhere between 20 and even up to 50% um, based on the history. Now, at 7 o'clock, this is where the danger is. And this is when people buy at the top of the global cycle, when all of the money in the world is in business, in the share market, in the property market. This is the time when property prices are increasing by just before it, you know, 15, 25, 30% in the, the last couple of years just before it, when everybody and their man and their dog is talking about it, kind of like where cryptocurrency was last year, I suppose. Um, and when the baker's talking about property like they were talking about crypto and everyone's making money and everyone's jumping over each other to get in, you know that there's big problems coming ahead. And so at point seven, that's where we get the major global correction. And that's where Europe, America, Australia, Asia, and everywhere comes down at the same time. At that point, that is where the stock market historically corrects by between 40 and 75%. That is also the time where property prices should correct in a huge way as well. So it's important to know those two points. Um, it's also important to know when to buy. And generally as investors or smart investors, we buy at times when other people aren't and when prices are correcting. Um, we don't necessarily buy when everybody else is. The next thing I wanted to touch on, and there's so much there, I, I'm sorry, in the last slide that I would love to catch up on. If people have questions about this, please start putting them in the chat so that, um, or the question box there on your screen so that David and I can come back to it at the end. It's a fascinating concept and some of you will be sitting there, you know, I, I remember the first time I took in some of this information from Phil, Phil and Fred and I was concerned it took me a couple of years to really wrap my head around it properly it's probably been five or six years now that I've been really following this stuff but the cycle at least to date has played out exactly like they forecast it would and just to put your minds at ease the next time we get to seven o'clock according to Phil and Fred is 2026 so we're not even halfway through the current cycle there is so much upside left that people don't understand right now um, you've just got to be careful over the next couple of years if you're heavily invested in the stock market. So the next thing I wanted to touch on um, is how to find the right market, suburb and street before purchasing a property. Now let's talk about the right market. For me, I'm a metro only investor and the reason I'm a metro only investor is I've looked at every single major metro and regional market in Australia over the last 10, 20, and 50 years. And what I've found is that Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane have been, over that longer term period of time, by far the top performer in all of Australia. So you can see Sydney over the last 46 years has gone up on average by 9.67. Melbourne's done 9.68% per annum on average, and Brisbane's done 9.7%. So Brisbane's actually been the top performing market in Australia over the last 46 years, which shocked me as someone who grew up in Sydney down at Cronulla Beach there. I always thought that Sydney was the best. You know, Melbourne's a place that you invest in if you can't afford Sydney. And then Brisbane's a distant third. But after getting really deep into the data, it, it surprised me. Now, Sydney and Melbourne have obviously had amazing gains since the last recession. And if you look at the data over the last 46 years, after every major you know, top of the cycle correction like a GFC event or the 1990s correction, Sydney and Melbourne always recover best over the first seven years. And then in the second seven years of the cycle, that's where Brisbane and some of the other regional markets and capital cities in Australia come into their own. One of the ways that I use to keep up to date from a market perspective is the RP data or core logic monthly updates. Now, you could click on the National Housing Update for October just by going through to their website and within 10 minutes you'll have a very accurate indication of where things are at. The reason I go straight to the best is because CoreLogic is the biggest producer of data in Australia and the biggest data collection agency in Australia, so they've got the most accurate stuff. What I also love about their market update is they look at Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra, Hobart, et cetera, and they really break it down. And then they look at the regional markets as well. 
Another great way to keep your finger on the pulse in terms of identifying the right market for you to invest in, because as investors, you know, in an ideal world, we'd all buy Sydney and Melbourne all the time. But the reality is Sydney and Melbourne are stuffed right now. And I don't believe Sydney and Melbourne are going to represent great buying opportunities until the next global financial crisis. So you've got to start looking outside of that. And, you know, this is Heron Todd White's report. They have been providing this monthly property clock with a 200 page report every single month now for the last five years and it is a really nice way of looking at where different marketplaces are at so you can see it um, what would be two o'clock starting to decline is Melbourne a declining market which is three o'clock is Illawarra and Sydney you can see at the bottom of the market there there's Darwin and Perth and then you can see at nine o'clock, which is the rising market, and the point that I like to buy is places like Adelaide, um, Brisbane, etc. So they do this for houses and for units, but it's a really nice way if you're just trying to figure out which market you're going to invest in in the next couple of years to really get your head around it accurately. So as investors, it isn't a scattergun approach where we try and do everything. It's much more of a focused approach where we target one market at a time. In terms of identifying the right suburb, I've found some data very, very interesting that Michael Matusik, who's an analyst in Queensland, recently put together. And what he looked at is Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth over the last 10 years. And what he looked at is inner city suburbs at the top there, which is within 5Ks, middle ring suburbs, which is between 5 and 20 k's and then outer suburbs which are over 20 to 25 k's from the city now why this is so important for you because when we identify the right market let's say that it's sydney for example we then look at the regions or the suburbs within sydney if you know your history and you look at this type of data you can see that the inner city and middle ring suburbs have performed in sydney over the last 10 years about 1.3% better per annum than than properties in the outer ring suburbs which is 20 more than 20 k's from the city so this information is already what i you know naturally thought from looking at trends over time but this data just accurately reconfirms that you really want to be buying within um you know 0 to 20 k's from the city what was interesting is there's no huge upside from buying between zero and five k's from the city which is the most expensive part in fact in many instances the middle ring suburbs between five and 15 in the last 10 years in all markets have performed better so it's important to remember this data when we're looking at suburbs and what we need to do is draw a, a, a heat map around sydney melbourne brisbane and only invest in stock if you can afford to within 20 k's of the cbd I'm sorry about this slide, it looks a little bit blurry right now, but when I look at investing in a suburb, what I do is I've, I've identified that Sydney's the marketplace, just theoretically. Obviously, it's not right now, Brisbane is. Um, but let's say that we use Sydney as an example. I'm looking for properties within 20Ks of the CBD. And then what I do is I look at properties within 20Ks that I can actually afford. Now, in Sydney right now, that's pretty tough for most of us. You know, not too many people have a lazy um, one to two million dollars sitting around right now, particularly with the lending changes, which is again why my strategy shifted to Brisbane, where I can get property within 10 Ks of the city for 550 grand, property within 20 Ks for 400,000 bucks. But, you know, in Sydney, we've gone 20 Ks from the city. Now, this is data that I've collected on one suburb. So let's say with Sydney, I've drawn the map around 20Ks. There's 15 suburbs in Sydney that I could afford within 20Ks. I'll look at all of these indicators plus about 15 more and decide to compare one suburb versus another. So I'll look at things like average annual price growth, and I want the average annual price growth to be as high as possible, although remembering that some markets have sat flat for 10 years, so there hasn't been much growth. I'll then look at rental vacancy rates so that I'm purchasing suburbs that have a really, really strong demand. I'll look at things like average household income, DSR scores, 
I'll look at the percentage of owner occupiers versus renters. And what I'm trying to do is by comparing 15 suburbs before I even start looking on realestate.com or talking to agents is I've reduced those 15 suburbs down based on some indicators that I look at to maybe a handful, two or three that are look really, really good right now on paper and have really strong potential for growth over the next 15 years during my hold period. Sorry, here's the second half of it. <laughs> um, so you can see um, DSR scores in there, walk scores in there. I look at transport and shops. I look at schools. I look at how the demand is according to realestate.com. I look at days on market. And this gives me an indicator. If you know how to understand this stuff properly, I can do. I can collect this data on any suburb within five minutes. Within an hour, I can compare all of the best suburbs in Brisbane or Sydney and Melbourne versus each other. And then I can reduce it down to maybe two or three suburbs that I'm going to do more research on. So once you've identified the suburb, sorry, the market you're going to buy in, let's say it's Sydney, and then the suburb that you're going to invest in within Sydney, let's say that it's Surrey Hills. What I then do is I go to the sold section of realestate.com. And as we know, we only buy houses because houses outperform units over time. And I'll explain that more in a moment. And what I do is I color code this. I break the suburb into three colors, green being cheap, red being middle, blue being premium. And then I just dot all of the sold properties in that particular suburb that are relevant to me over the last 12 months or two years, however deep you want to get until you begin to understand where the cheap, where the middle, and where the premium pockets of a suburb are. So for any of you looking at my mouse right now, you can sort of see there's a cluster there next to Lee Hughes Sporting Complex in this particular suburb, which is Bray Park in Brisbane, where there's a big cluster of blue properties that have been sold. So that is the premium pocket. And as an investor, it's not just important to identify the right market, the right suburb but it's important to identify the right street and the right property within that suburb as well so i always buy the middle to premium pockets of suburbs because anybody who's owned in sydney or melbourne in the last 20 years knows that the premium areas get more premium the shitty areas slowly improve in value but nowhere near as quickly i then as i said jump into the sold section now i don't use realestate.com too much personally or for our clients because we use RP data, which, you know, realestate.com might have 30% of the sold properties where RP data has 100%. But I then begin to understand the sales history data. And from there, I physically go into the area and start scouting it out and talking to people and going to that next layer. In terms of due diligence, which is the next thing I wanted to touch on, the quality of your team of advisors and the quality of your due diligence and research before you start looking for property is the difference between absolutely killing it as a property investor and making big, big, big mistakes. Now, I've made some huge mistakes, which I'll talk about um, a bit later on in the presentation, but you know, all of us are going to make mistakes if you're going into this first time as an investor or first time at all or you know, you've only done this a couple of times before. There's going to be things that you just miss like I did when I first started out. But over time, you can have a better process and a better system so that those things that you missed out before become learning lessons and you move in the right direction. In terms of doing world-class due diligence, to me, it really comes down to the quality of your team. So my mortgage broker, Aaron, owns 40 investment properties completely outright. He's 45 years of age. He bought all of those properties before he even started in the business of broking. My solicitor owns his home and a number of other investment properties, commercial and residential outright, as does my accountant. Obviously, your buyer's agent should own investment properties and should ultimately be financially free as well. If the, your team that you're working with isn't already financially free, there's nothing wrong with that but they're still in the same position as anybody else who's not, which is trading time for money. And if you're trading time for money as an advisor, sometimes you can help people make decisions that are in your best interest as opposed to their best interests. Now, a town planner, building and pest inspector, property manager and builder should all be 
vital part of that team as well. And, you know, all of those people play different roles. It's your job to manage those people and to hold them accountable and to look after your best interest. Now, I know in the email that Dave sent out, we said what not to buy, but after actually sitting down and thinking about this, I thought it would be much easier because there's literally hundreds of things that we have in a checklist that we wouldn't buy, but there's really only four or five things that we would buy. So the things that we would buy in terms of priorities from a market perspective or a high level is Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. This is an image of the last 46 years worth of data. You can see anywhere that's highlighted is a year where the capital city got over 10% growth in that year. And anything that's in white is a year where it didn't. Now, despite Sydney and Melbourne looking really, really good from that perspective, if you actually overlay the data over 46 years, because Brisbane doesn't spike and then decline as much as Sydney and Melbourne, Brisbane has actually been the top performer. So in terms of what to buy, always buy your metro areas. If you can't afford your metro areas of Sydney and Melbourne, then you need to start getting your head around Brisbane. Now, this is some information that absolutely rocked me. Over the last two decades or 20 years, RP Data found that nationally, the metro markets increased by 252% across the seven largest capital cities and only 167% across the seven largest regional markets. Now, if I'm an investor with a limited number of funds that is only going to buy a number of properties over a lifetime, I'm going to choose the market. That's over an 80% difference in property prices over 20 years, which is if you divide that out is 4% per annum, you would be 4% better off per annum by buying metro over regional. Now, the reason this is so important is if we look at data, if you were to go buy a $400,000 property right now and hold it for the next 15 years and just get yourself a 2% better return per annum over 15 years on your 400K, you would be $180,000 better off by just making that one decision. But if you were to go buy a million dollar property right now, and over, hold it for the next 15 years, and over 15 years just get 2% better return per year. We're not even talking 4%, which is the history here. Just 2% on a million dollars, you'd be over $580,000 better off by just buying a market that gets you that extra 2% per annum. So when people say to me that I don't buy I'm buying regional or I buy regional because it's close to home, that's cool, but would you walk past five or $600,000 in the street in 15 years time? Because that is the result of missing that 2% per annum. And think about how much better off you'll be, how much better off your family will be if you can, you know, make yourself an extra 500K or 600 grand without going to work over the next 20 years. Another thing there when I'm talking about this little 2% thing is houses over units. Now, again, if we look at RP's data over the last 10 years, houses have increased by 73%, where units have increased by 64%. Now, you know, that's almost a 1% difference per annum. And again, if you're only going to take a limited number of options, if you can get 4% a year better by buying Metro, and 1% better per year by buying a house over a unit, you're already 5% up in terms of your future. Now, I don't believe that prices are going to keep going up like they have in the past, but in some areas outside of Sydney and Melbourne, houses are extremely, extremely affordable right now. So don't get caught up in the hype of what's going on in those two markets as a true representation of where Australia's at. Another absolute piece of gold from Michael Matusik that I follow to a T is buying less than 20Ks from the CBD. Now, I, I talked about that before. And as you can see um, in Melbourne, for example, if you were to buy in um, Melbourne's middle ring, which is between 5 and 20Ks, it would have gone up by an average of almost 8% a year over the last 10 years. If we looked at being further than that back, 
um, we're talking about almost 7%. So that's another easy 1%. And as investors, we need to start understanding these rules and applying them consistently. So if you were to apply, I only buy Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, I only buy Metro, I only buy houses, I buy within 20 k's from the city, or I buy walking distance to the beach, then you are giving yourself the absolute best chance of kicking some ass in the future in terms of long-term growth. Now, you and I can't control what's going to happen within one year to five years, so stop worrying about it. But if you invest now, I can guarantee 15 to 30 years from today, if it's the right type of product, you're going to be in a much, much better financial position than you are today. Now, I wanted to give you guys some examples of some people that we've worked with recently, just so that you can understand their story. Now, I caught up with Dave on Friday. Um, he flew up from Sydney. He's 53 years of age, and he owns his own home outright, works in the construction industry. On top of owning his own home outright, he also owns four houses with four granny flats. At 53 years of age, Dave's never earned more than a combined annual salary of $150,000 per year with his wife, and he now receives over 100,000 bucks a year in passive income from the properties that he's diligently paid off and purchased over the last 25 years. Now, Dave's obviously a really sophisticated investor. Before working with us, he'd already bought 11 properties himself, but he employed me after trying to buy the Brisbane market himself for three months because he realized that he was out of his depth in terms of that market and wanted some specialty knowledge. Now, this is the property that we bought for Dave. It was in a suburb 20 k's from the CBD with a train station with one of the best schools in Brisbane, two kilometers from a university. Um, we bought this property for $403,000. It was a three-bedroom home on a 600-square-meter piece of land. Now, Dave came up because he's a bit handy and he organized some trades to clean the place up. Now, that's the before photo. That's the after he spent $30,000 on the property cleaning it up. Um, he didn't need to do that, but um, Dave understands the game and understands that if he's got a high quality property, he will attract a much high quality tenant. Now, Dave wasn't just satisfied with your do your standard thing. Dave wanted cash flow. He wanted capital growth and he wanted to make some money on the way in by cleaning it up. So not only did Dave clean up the property, he also just finished this week. That's why I was down there on Friday with him building this two bedroom granny flat out in the backyard. Now he's built three other granny flats before, um, but he's really proud of what he decided to do here. This is the inside of the granny flat. It's a two bedroom, 55 square meter granny flat. And I think it come up looking amazing. Now, here's Dave's numbers. He purchased his home for 403000 and spent 30000 on the reno. The house now rents out for 400 bucks a week. He then went and built a granny flat for 135000 which is quite a bit more than the average price that our client pays, which is more like 120 because he wanted to pimp it out a little bit and he gets the game. But he has now rented it out within one weekend for 310 bucks a week. So his total project cost was... $568,000, he's 20 k from the city, and he gets $710 a week in rent today. So we're talking high sixes in terms of rental yield, and he's got this property that he now doesn't have to think about for the next 10 years because he's cleaned it up. Paul has become one of my best mates, and Paul is a amazing guy. Um, Paul has bought three properties with us now, and um, since that time, he's gone on to move into the property industry as a mortgage broker. He lives in Brisbane, um, but even though he was in Brisbane, he hadn't actually invested before he came to us three years ago. In the last three years, he's actually gone out and bought five properties. Every single one of those properties has upside. Some of them are townhouse sites. Some of them are houses that he can renovate and at a granny flat too. Others are properties where we've bought land for him and built. So um, he wanted to focus on buying houses within 20 k's of the city or on the beach. 
This is a property that we helped him build in a suburb called Brighton, which is 19 k's from the city in Brisbane. Now, we picked up this land for $339,000, and then we built that four bedroom home for 230k. The house rented out in the first week for $530,000, and the total project cost him five, just under 570 k On the day the house was completed, Paul got the property revalued by his bank Westpac at $650,000, which was an equity gain of $81,000 on the property just from building over that five-month period it took him to build. So there are some incredible opportunities in Brisbane if you're interested in short-term equity uplift from building right now. If you know how to get the land at the right price and the build at the right price, not only is Paul in an incredible suburb that's going to get long-term growth, he's got a good rent return, he's got great tax depreciation benefits, and he's made $81,000, which was the entire deposit that he put on the property. He's pulled that deposit back out and now he can go buy another property without any of his own cash down. So really really interesting story and that's just one of Paul's properties. I thought I'd share a project that I'm doing at the moment just to um, share sort of something a little bit different. Um, now at the bottom of this um, diagram there, <laughs> diagram what am I saying, at the bottom of this picture here this aerial view you can see this um, two vacant lots there so um, this is in a suburb on the beaches of Brisbane, obviously right next to the golf course in a very premium area, 400 metres walking distance to the water, um, a kilometres walking distance to the three best schools in the area. Now, I bought this site and I subdivided it and then I sold off one of the sides of the property and I kept the other piece of land and I'm building this um, big bad boy on it, which is a four bedroom home as you can see on the um, top side of this floor plan here. Um, I'm building four bedroom home with a nice big kitchen, living family area and a huge alfresco out the back onto the backyard. And then on the other side, I put in a two bedroom granny flat. So this is a brand new dual income property. Now there's a lot of people selling this sort of stuff in Sydney and Southeast Queensland at the moment. Don't buy it in shitty locations, in greenfield sites in the middle of nowhere, 30 or 40 k's from the city. Find quality infill blocks like this one and build it in areas that are also going to get long-term growth. Now I can see my first bedroom, second bedroom, a nice living kitchen area and then an alfresco onto the backyard as well. So I was able, after going through the subdivision, to get my piece of land for $335,000. It's a nice big 660 square meter block there. I'm building this home or dual income home, the four bedroom house with the two bedroom granny flat for 300K. I've had a rental appraisal at $800 a week. So it's cost me $635,000 for the house and the granny flat, and it's gonna rent for 800 a week. Now what's interesting about this area is if I went and bought a normal home around here that's high quality, I would have paid $500,000 for the home alone, and then I would have paid $120,000, $130,000 for the granny flat, which would have made my total project cost $630,000 for an existing property. But instead, I've gone for a brand new product and traded that for $635K. So the last thing I wanted to touch on before we get into clients, and if anyone has any any questions about any of tonight's stuff so far, please start putting those in there so David and I can get to them. But I wanted to touch on my personal investment strategy. These are the things that I've learned from buying over $350 million worth of property for myself and my clients. For me to even consider a property, it has to have long-term capital growth potential. Now, I'm not sitting there and watching the property year to year because I know that some years I'm going to make 20%, some years I'm going to make nothing, and some years over the next 20 years I'm going to lose 20% in a year. As an investor, you have to be aware that any one of those scenarios could happen at any time. All I'm playing for is an average capital growth rate of 4 to 5% per year, which means every 15 years I double my money in the property that I own. It's absolutely necessary for me to get great cash flow from anything I own now as well. And like you've seen in Paul's example and my example, because my property will be revalued at 
720, $730,000 on completion. It's important to get short term equity. One, it reduces your risk. Two, it enables you to move forward with other properties without using your own money if you want to. The fourth thing and probably the most important thing that I touched on before is the time the real estate cycle. So I was buying Sydney in 2011, 12, 13, and then I started to buy the Central Coast in 13 and 14. I haven't touched the Sydney market from a buying perspective since then, and I sold out all of the properties I own there between 2016 and early 2017. I'm now buying Brisbane, and my intention is to hold a number of high quality assets in Brisbane and then sell a number of those assets in about 2025 just before we go into the next global financial crisis. Now, that's a bit more of an active strategy than some of you may have, but I like to move my money around and keep my money working for me and then have a number of assets, two, three, four properties that I own outright, giving me cash flow for life. I only target metro markets and houses. As we touched on before, I like to buy within 20 k's of the city or on the beach. And I do have a long term buy and hold strategy for the properties that tick all of these boxes. So that's kind of where I come from. Um, you know, they're the lessons that I've learned. And it's really, really simple to do well in property if you follow these things. It's really easy to come unstuck on property if you don't understand them properly. David, I'm not sure if you want to hook back in now, mate. Um, to sort of talk through some of this stuff as we move on from here. What I wanted to do okay. is, um, you know, not spend any much meaningful time on this right now, but as part of tonight's webinar, I'd love the opportunity to offer anybody who's interested a one-on-one -on -one strategy session. You can do that by jumping over to www.pumpedonproperty.com forward slash strategy session. We will sit down for an hour and we will look at where you are right now and where you're looking to go in the future over the next 12 months and 15 years. We'll then look at the challenges or what's hanging you up from actually implementing that right now. Some of that might be mindset, some of it might be budget, some of it might be borrowing capacity, some of it might be a partner that you have. Um, I know I dragged my wife kicking and screaming through this stuff for the first five years, but now she's on board. Um, but I'd love to sit down with you and learn more about that and then educate you on what's going up here in southeast Queensland right now and talk about the Australian marketplace and then from there um, take the conversation wherever you want to take it. Now, as a commitment to Munifly and David, that is complimentary. We're not going to try and sell you anything. It's purely value add. Um, we actually only take on five to eight clients a month in our business. So, um, you know, it's not a huge sales pitch or anything like that. It's purely just adding as much value to you and your life and your situation as possible. And David, I've probably ran, I don't know, what, a hundred of these sessions for your clients in um, this business or previous businesses before. Um, and I think, you know, from the feedback that you've had, it's been pretty clear that we just try and do our absolute best um, and, you know, go from it from that perspective. So, Dave, I'm just going to add you back as the presenter now as we kick off the next part of this webinar. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ben. Um, and, I, yeah, I mean, just some thoughts on that. The, uh, the things that Ben is talking about, you know, it's, when you see this stuff, you think, oh, it's not rocket science, um, and, and it's not. Um, it just takes a hell of a lot of work to uh, be able to follow the market and understand to the degree Ben, ben and his team do because he's, he's in the market. And when I started investing in 1999 in property and probably first 10 or 12 properties I bought, half of them were through a buyer's agent and half of them were just me doing deals myself directly. And, and you know, I, I quite, I was a busy guy and I quite quickly learned the, the power of leverage. And, and if, if someone else is really, is better at me than something and, and, um, I'm making money, but they're doing the work. I'm always happy. Um, and what I like about Ben, uh, and I've followed his business for a long time, uh, and I've seen the results with, you know, clients, the businesses I've been involved in. Uh, he's just, he's got, he sticks to the nuts and bolts, and he follows the formula, and he follows it well. And he's not taking a punt on a developer or a development. He's not selling you stock off the plan. He's not selling you stock in the inner city. 
um, he's not a buyer's agent being paid by the developer masquerading as somebody pretending to help you. Um, he just has a really, really good, solid fundamental grasp of real estate. And he's one of those teachers that uh, is just basically teaching his clients to do what he does already, which is why he knows it well and understands it. So um, I, I invited Ben along um, to to speak based on the interest we have in the content from Pumped on Property uh, and everything Ben and his team produce. Uh, and I think it's a good refresher sometimes, even, even when these uh, concepts are not um, not uncommon, it then they're not always come to practice and it's easy as investors to chase all sorts of shiny, glittery stuff, but um, sometimes we come unstuck doing that as well, um, particularly if you're taking a long-term view. So so we have had some questions come through and I've got some questions as well, uh, Ben, so I'm just going to weave a combination of those in. Um, so the first one is, um, what are the zoning and consent issues that you have to learn when you're thinking about putting granny flats on, on properties and do they very much even within the greater Brisbane region, is there much variation in, in its own consent rules or are they all the same across the board? Uh, it's a great question, David. Sorry, I just don't have my headphones on, so I'm just going to have to mute you for a second if that's okay while I answer this and then I'll put you back in. Um, sure. So there's a huge difference between um, granny flat laws in southeast Queensland. For example, in the Gold Coast City Council, Redlands Bay Council, which is Northern Gold Coast and Brisbane City Council, it's actually illegal to build and rent a granny flat out to anyone that's not a family member. Um, whereas on, in North Brisbane, South Brisbane, West Brisbane and the Sunshine Coast, you can actually legally build and rent out a granny flat. So a lot of the strategy, because I'm a huge fan of the North Brisbane region from a granny flats perspective, is targeted to that area. Um, Basically, the rule there is there's no particular lot size like there is in New South Wales, for example, where the lot has to be over 450 metres. Um, but in North Brisbane, you're really looking for a house at the front of the block with a nice big 15 metre wide frontage. And if the frontage is over 15 metres um, and the site complies, obviously with the council or the town planning check, then you can actually build um, a nice big granny flat there, a uh, 55 square metre one. Okay, that's good to know. And so on the subject of town planners, this is an interesting one. I mean, a number of investors I speak, I've spoken to over the years are, are terrified of the thought of anything that involves um, talking to a council, uh, somebody at council, talking to a town planner, talking to a, a surveyor. I mean, what what tips do you have for somebody thinking, well, this, this sounds good, but I just want to have to talk to those people. Um, how, do you, how do you pick up the phone and talk to a town planner for the first time? <laughs> it's not the funnest yeah. conversation because... Um, a lot of town planners don't like to ask questions, um, or sorry, don't like to answer questions more than um, don't like to ask them. So they're sort of trying to protect, I find a lot of the time, particularly private town planners, their liability, and they don't want to tell you too much. But, you know, what I would do is, um, you know, focus on a particular suburb and understand that suburb, and then reach out to one or two town planners, pay them for 30 minutes of their time and let them know that, you're planning on buying a house and you'd like to add a granny flat in that area, get them to educate you on what's important to understand and what you need to do to comply. Um, alternatively, you can ring up the local council and ask them, um, obviously they've got free planners that are on the phone all the time to take these types of questions. And, you know, on top of what you learn from the town planner or two, you know, um, pick up what you can from the local councillor as well. Um, alternatively, I've had a town planner that I've been working with up here for the last five years. Um, he's relatively good. Um, what he does for our clients when we buy is a um, site investigation report, which basically looks at the highest and best use of the site. And legally, before we go out and buy a property, um, gives you the tick of approval that you can actually build a granny flat on it, which gives you that peace of mind before you actually need to legally do anything, which I think is very important. Yeah, absolutely. You can spend a lot of time, a lot of money and go quite a long way with a property only to find out at the end you can't do what you thought you you could do. So it's good to get that advice early. Uh, even, even if there's cost involved, it's still it's still time you're saving. Um, so um, another question that's come up is, uh, Ben, uh, do you have any experience with you or your clients using granny flats for short stay accommodation, i.e. like through Airbnb? Uh, it's a really good question. I um, 
haven't done that personally. Most of our clients live in, you know, Perth, Canberra, Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne, or Darwin. So, um, you know, because they're not on the ground up here, the Airbnb strategy is a little bit more active. Um, most of the clients that we work with are looking for that consistent 50 to 52 weeks a year of rent and sort of setting and forgetting the property after they've picked it up. Um, on the Sunshine Coast, it's actually something that my wife and I have been beginning to play with um, ourselves just because um, she's had, or we've had the three kids now and wanted to do something a little bit different. So um, we're beginning to play with that one now. And, you know, one of my rules is unless I've tested it out in a market myself, I would never have a conversation with a client about making it work or not work. So, um, yeah, interesting concept. It'd be cool to hear if anyone else has done something like that. Well, it's a good point you make about being an absentee investor or absentee manager um, that, that adds to it. And, and then, of course, if you've got a property that's in a, in a more of a tourist location like the Sunshine Coast too, that's only got to help um, with occupancy as well. So it's not it's not for everybody, is it, um, as a strategy? Yeah, I think the Sunshine Coast um, has the lowest vacancy rate of any place in Australia right now from an accommodation perspective. And with this airport wow. they're putting in, um, it looks super interesting from the number of extra tourists we're going to catch a year. I think it'll be, you know, within five to six years, maybe an extra three or 400,000 people a year. The population up here is expected to grow by 30%, um, the local council saying over the next 10 years as well. So those types of strategies in tourist destinations could be really interesting to play with. Wow. And is that an expansion of the Maruchido Airport or is that a different airport altogether? Uh, that's an expansion of the Maruchidor Airport. They're going from just taking domestic flights to a complete second runway, um, which will allow for international travel now, similar to what they did in the Gold Coast a while back. Um, super interesting. I put together a blog the other day, which was um, looking at the infrastructure projects in Brisbane, the Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast. And what we found is that over the next 10 years, in terms of the projects that are already underway, private and government funded, we're talking $43 billion worth of projects. It's just from airports to universities to hospitals to major road upgrades, like all the way through to new train lines and tram lines and undercity rail. Like there's just so much stuff going on right now up here, which is amazing from a jobs perspective. It was just... Um, recently that Brisbane's average household income has now taken over the average household income in Melbourne. And as we all know, wow. there's more people moving to Southeast Queensland from an Australian perspective than anywhere else in Australia right now, to the point where wow. Brisbane's actually the only unit market in Australia now completely undersupplied from a property perspective. So things are definitely changing. I looked at some data from CoreLogic last week, where they looked at 30 years worth of growth in Southeast Queensland. And there's literally no other point in the last 30 years where the population growth rate has been this strong, where capital growth and values of properties haven't moved with it. Um, but I think because the government's making money so hard to get, and so many people are sitting on the sidelines because they can't differentiate Southeast Queensland from Sydney and Melbourne right now, um, like I said, I believe with this mid-cycle slowdown thing that we're in right now, um, the next couple of years could be probably the best buying opportunities over the next 15 in Brisbane. Wow. Definitely going to be a lot of pent-up demand. There's a lot of people that want to invest that can't right now because of the various challenges with lending rules and valuations. It's just the um, perfect storm right now. We've got jobs increasing. We've got population increasing. We've got huge amounts of infrastructure spending and we've got more people than we've had in 20 years moving over the border. So it's, you know, interesting. I think it's like a bow and arrow at the moment. It's being pulled back tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, you know, where Sydney's, what, 10 times the average household income to buy the average property, Brisbane's still sitting at 5% right now. So it's perfectly in line with where it's always been. Wow. Well, that's right. And any time you have massive population growth and massive spending, it, it always converts to demand for property and property prices going up. It just it just can't not at some point catch up in terms of that translating into growth. It's just the law of the universe, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, it's not going to be a runaway like it was in Sydney and Melbourne. But as an investor, I'm less interested in getting 50% in three years 
and more interested in getting 100% over 15 type thing. So the boom and bust or short cash is something that I've let go of and it's more about consistent long-term returns now that I'm interested in. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and it's way less pain as well if you don't have the big sort of overcooked exactly. market that then drops 10 or 20%. Um, I mean, you, okay, you're happy yeah, when you get the short-term returns, but um, you know, as people are already starting to feel in Sydney now, some of the beachside suburbs on the southern and northern beaches that were very over-speculated in between 2017 and now have, have come back almost 15%, and that's also very heavy to take as well. Yeah, well, especially if you got in late in the piece um, and you've only made a small gain or actually gone backwards because you left it too late to charge into the market. Um, so granny flats are a great strategy, and you know some of the feedback I hear from investors are they're, they're terrified about the process and the complexity. So, so I mean, just just spend a minute and explain with your knowledge what does your team actually do around project managing the process for clients so they don't actually have to face the the grief and the challenges of architects and councils and neighbours and, and everything else. Yeah. So as part of the fee that clients. Um, pay us to work with us um, we effectively sit down with them and build a 12-month plan as well as a 15-year plan from a property perspective um, we then introduce them to whoever they need in our team of advisors be mortgage brokers solicitors accountants granny flat builders etc and what we do is we educate them on the market then we go and find the perfect property but as part of what they've paid us for they've also paid us to support them with the town planning the accreditation and certification and to project the entire building from start to finish on their behalf. So literally all we require from a client is 15 to 30 minutes of communication a week and 15 to 30 minutes of them reviewing our emails, videos and calls. And then everything else is done by us. Like we will help them get the perfect design. We'll help them select the colors. We'll help them lock in a fixed price contract. We'll help them get finance for the granny flat. We'll then get the council approval. We'll project manage the entire thing. It actually only takes eight weeks to build a granny flat. It's really quick. Um, and then we will make sure that the product's to, to standard, um, getting an independent company to do a check on it just before handover. And then we'll introduce the client to the right property manager to get a premium for the property as well on completion. So it's full service end to end with education as the focus all the way through. Okay, that's great. And 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 also on that, um, a question has come through on, so is granny flat construction, Does that do banks treat that as um, a construction loan? And, and then do you have, if they do, do you have mortgage brokers or financiers that you work with that understand the process and can manage the finance approval or refinancing of people who are looking to do the construction side of uh, granny flats, whether it be on bare land or an existing the existing house and land build like you're doing with from from brand new or, or, or you know a granny flat being added to the back of an existing house on, a, on an existing block yeah so from an existing property perspective what we do is we buy the house on the day of settlement we get a fence built and we rent out the front house within the first two weeks so you're getting cash flow all the way through and then mm -hmm. we go and get a separate building contract and construction loan for whatever it is that you need to finance for the granny flat. And the way the construction works or construction loan works is you effectively pay the builder seven small payments over the course of the eight to 10 week build. Um, and then at the end of it, you roll that total loan for the granny flat into the total loan, loan for the house. So it's just one nice package. And then you get the rent from the house and the rent from the granny flat put into one account as well so it all it all sort of puts it in a nice bow um, if you're looking at the brand new option in terms of finding an infill high quality piece of land in the right suburb and then building um, from that perspective it's a little bit different we go out and we find the right piece of land we then get the right building contract in place and then once the land is yours and you legally own it we then go through the same construction process where there's seven different payments over the course of a build, which takes generally between 14 and 16 weeks, weather dependent. Okay, great. Well, that clarifies that really well. And um, final question for the night in terms of what's come through. Um, so your business, is, your business operates as a buyer's agent. And, and ha so how are you different to some of those 
other buyers agents who, who also call themselves buyers agents, but sometimes act for the vendor or the developer instead. Like what's your, I guess, what, what are the rules that keep clients safe or what, what's your point of difference? So I guess it's a question. We don't take any commissions from real estate agents, which a lot of other agencies do. Um, and from a mm-hmm. building, we don't take any commissions from developers or the people selling land. We don't take any commissions in relation to builders or any of our team of advisors that isn't completely disclosed with you. And if we were to take that type of referral fee, then it would be fully disclosed. The thing about the way that we work is we've negotiated a wholesale rate for the granny flats as well as the builds in Queensland and southeast Queensland. So we're on average saving our clients between thirty and $80,000 on their home construction. Um, a client yeah. of mine in Perth, who we worked with, um, just bought himself another piece of land recently and he sent me through the quote for $480,000. It was a really nice home that he was planning on moving on into. I took one look at the quote, called my builder and was able to help him build the exact same product for $80,000 less. So, um, you know, it's not just we're, you know, doing everything we can to get you the right long-term outcome, but in all of our relationships, we've negotiated huge discounts where they see us as one client bringing them five people a year as opposed to you being a mum or dad that's walked off the street doing it once and once only. Well, and also, I guess they get the leverage of you sourcing stock directly for their clients so they don't have to build fat sales commissions in to sell that stock through the, you know, retail real estate agents or, or other sales channels. So, you know, that gives you that advantage by going uh, direct. You know, so, as you know, Dave, like unfortunately, 80% of brand new properties in Australia that are more than 20 k's from the city are sold through what's called property marketers and Generally, that product is overpriced by between thirty and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and the average commission from a property marketer that sells eighty percent of the brand new stock in Australia is between thirty and one hundred and twenty thousand dollars per property. So, people are getting absolutely ripped off right now, and you and I both have the same opinion on that. Like, it makes me sick that people that are only going to buy a couple of properties in their life get screwed over like that and that was a big reason why we went into this space yeah and it's a really good point point. and i've seen so many people who then have a property that has got negative equity at settlement and they spend the next five to ten years just getting back to their starting point before they start to get growth and often in those areas they're in greenfields areas where there's just thousands and thousands of blocks being released over you know 10 15 20 years and because they control the speed at which they release it to suppress the growth um where they get a little bit of growth a modest growth over time but but every time they start to get modest growth they just release more stock so you you never have a supply and demand issue in your favor because there's always plenty of supply because they're controlling the supply so you know the whole concept of finding an infill block or a block that you can put an extra dwelling on um on the back of an existing house when you're in a built-up area that's got all the services all the infrastructure around it you know it's just it's just such a a great concept for creating instant equity um but also just better capital growth because you're in that you know five to fifteen kilometer kind of radius from the cbd as well so yeah like so that's um, great well you know buying buying greenfield sites from stocklands for example works w- when we're in a good market um where stocklands is artificially controlling the supply and drip feeding it to the market and keeps bumping it up but when we get into a GFC, we know that these companies like AV Jennings and Stocklands just pump the stock onto the market to fire sale it and it stuffs everybody's valuations in an area for five to 10 years time. And, you know, that's a, a big reason. And as you know, like you've bought a lot of property yourself and you've helped people buy as well. It's these simple little lessons that if you can avoid them um, without making all the mistakes that you and I personally have, you can end up being yeah. in a much better position. And, like I said before, I, I truly believe that I could be in as good or a better position from buying maybe two or four absolutely high quality properties using what I now know, as opposed to the 11 properties that I've bought and all of the activity and time that that's taken to go through that. So, you know, we, we live and we learn as investors. And the cool thing about getting to help people do this every day is you learn very, very, very quickly type thing. So, you know, you and I were talking three, three and a half years ago in webinars we were running back then that we could see that the Sydney market and the cycle was coming to an end and we were actively starting to talk Brisbane then. And 
when you understand the bigger picture timing stuff and you follow the right people in the market, it's, you know, you can never accurately see the direct future, but you can start to see the patterns and the trends and respond to them a little bit earlier and take advantage of opportunities as they come up. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that takes research and knowing the market and knowing the indicators because often by the time it gets to the media, it's already three to six months um, behind where the, where the curve or trend really is because there's a lag time with the data from signing a contract of settlement to the data being available is often two to three months before it's officially released and available. And so by the time, you know, another three months goes by and it becomes a trend, you know, the media is saying the market's going to crash and the market's topped out. Well, that happened six months ago. So you can't rely, you can't rely on the media to tell you when to get in or get out because there's always a lag time. Um, with it's the funny media. that you say um, that. Like um, Nicole, who's one of the um, chief editors at Yahoo Finance, um, who we regularly contribute to, gave me a call yesterday and she's like, Ben, I just checked out one of your videos talking about, you know, I think the title was Is the Australian Property Market's Going to Crash Now? I don't know when I published that. It, it feels like ages ago um, where I talked about the negative things going on from a property perspective and an economic perspective in Australia and some of the positive stuff. And she's mm -hmm. like, yeah, we'd really like to feature the video and, you know, write out the points. And I'm kind of like, man, I recorded that video like in one way or another, like two years ago. And she's like, well, nobody's talking positively about the Australian market right now in mainstream media. It's nice to have a fresh perspective. And I feel that like I feel people that have been following the same old stuff on the Today Show and A Current Affair because it's selling media space over the last 12 to 18 months or even you and I originally started to feel it in 2015 when APRA started to originally step in and um, start doing what they've done now, which I think is really positive. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's just one of those things. Like with more experience in anything in life, you make better decisions and the more experience that you've had, obviously the easier it is to see this sort of stuff. and you and I can take it for granted sometimes in terms of this stuff, but the reality is it's taken 10 years or 20 years to build those skills. Oh, absolutely. And, and if every time I did a deal, I went forwards, I would be in a so much better place today financially than two steps forwards and one, steps back, one step backwards. And, and then even as you get better at it, if you always go forward, but sometimes slower, sometimes fast, that's, there's still a, a, an impediment to just picking winners time after time after time. And, most people don't realize the whole concept of, you know, if a property doubles in value every 10 years, you think, yeah, well, I paid 200, then it's four, then it's six, then it's eight. No, it's, it goes from two to four to eight to 1.6. And, and so there's a massive difference to your net result if you can, if you can have a property double in value two to three times in, in, in you know, 25 to 30 years versus take, um, take 15 years each time to double in value because it's a regional property or it's, you know, it's not in a, a demand area. So, it's that compounding growth that's just incredible once it leapfrogs the second or third time, not just the first it's time. It's such an interesting uh, concept to say that because let's just say theoretically you could buy a property that would double every 15 years and to do that you only need a 4.8% per year increase in the value. So it would be hard not to get that in Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane. Um, you yeah. go from 400 to 800, you go from 800 to 1.6, you go from 1.6 to 3.2 mil. It's just if you've got a few of those winners in the market, you could be you could end up being worth in forty years time ten million dollars from two or three properties if you do it right. It's just yeah, absolutely. crazy how quickly this stuff works. And that's why smart people understand compound growth and they make the decisions that I talked about, you know, it might not sound like much, a one percent difference between buying houses and units or a four percent difference being buying metro versus regional, but smart investors are constantly chasing that extra return because I know that 2% on a million bucks over 15 years to my family is 600 grand. What if you've got $3 million worth of property? That's, you know, we're talking $2 million better off you'll be just by buying better quality stuff. So I didn't understand that at the start, but I'll never forget that now. No, absolutely. I never got the gravity of it either. And even at the time when something doubles the value, you think, wow, I did, but wow, that can't happen again. It'd be way too expensive. And But it's so easy for me to look back now over 20 years of investing, um, well, sorry, 30 years um, of investing. Um, <laughs> awesome. And, I and, 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 and I'm, I'm 48 <laughs> years old, so there you go. Uh, There's a confession. Um, but, but you know, it, it, 
there's properties now that are a million dollars that that when they were half a million dollars ten years ago, and they just they jumped jumped up from two hundred thousand ten years earlier. We said, well, half a million is way too much. It's overpriced, and you know, here we go again, five or seven year, years later, and the same things repeated in, in those quarterly locations. So, it's one thing the I just to touch on around that is. Um, I've been looking at international markets a lot and what's been happening there over the last 50 to a couple of hundred years. Like I've really been going broad in my analysis in the last three years and people go say to me, Sydney and Melbourne are expensive all the time. Um, like they've just been downgraded from a risk profile to just highly overpriced. So we're no longer in like boom or bust territory, which is cool. And the weird thing outside of Australia is People in Singapore and New York are being sold Australian property in Sydney, Melbourne right now, and they're saying it is dirt cheap in their advertising. Wow. Those people wow. are also, um, like from an Australian perspective, looking at what APRA did and other governments around the world, like Canada, for example, and some of the European countries are looking to implement what APRA did because they believe that that is now world's best practice in banking. It's just, it feels really bad right now in Australia from a sentiment perspective, but it's really not. Like when you think that Sydney at some point in our lifetime is going to be a city of 20 million people, as long as there is a residential property with just a house on it within 30 k's of the city, then the airspace above that site has not yet been capitalized into the market like it has in Tokyo, New York, and London. And to me, that is dirt cheap and means that this cycle can continue to go on so much further than we think it will because everything within 15 k's of Sydney in our lifetime will be rezoned to 15 to 30 storeys. And today's prices are going to seem so cheap then down the line. Yeah, that's why the change of use, just you take a quantum leap once that happens. And Sydney's population today is what New York's was in 1920. It's just... Wow. New York's just, you know, further ahead. But New York hasn't always been as big as it is. And people forget that it actually grew from something much smaller. Um, and, you know, that's where Sydney is now. So, um, so it's yeah, that's right. It's carrying on along that same path where the, the, it'll just get more and more in, intensified in terms of the inner city construction and the change in um, use of land. Well, Ben, that's excellent. That covers all of the questions that have come in and, and that I had. And... Thanks to everybody who attended the webinar tonight who stayed on for the QA session as well. So we've recorded this, so we'll get this tomorrow as part of the follow-up. We'll send you out the follow-up details of how to um, get hold of um, Ben, but you should you know scribble that down off the screen right now or go to pumpedonproperty.com directly. Um, and, and it's a great opportunity to take out the strategy session offer because you don't know what you don't know. Uh, and often we think we we know enough, but it's amazing what you learn when you talk to people who have done, done a lot and achieved a lot and, and have done some good things. So. I highly recommend you take up Ben's generous offer uh, and look at how you can avail yourself of pumped on property services. Um, they're really, really good at what they do. They've walked the talk for a lot, as long as I've known Ben, um, five years plus now. Um, and you know, life's about leveraging the expertise of others. Um, and it's about return on investment. Um, and, and if you can leverage the expertise of others and get a better return, um, then um, you can achieve some good things. So Ben, thank you very much for putting all of that data and information together and for your giving us your slant on it because um, that's always what brings it to life and makes it interesting and um, thanks for putting aside the time and, and uh, we'll look forward to um, continuing to work with you as a great partner of Butterfly. Yeah, no problems, mate. Thanks a lot and sorry if I geeked out a bit too much with the data for people tonight but I just, I'm so obsessed with this stuff and I love learning and I, I hope you've got some value as well and um, thanks so much for having me, mate.